there's always a risk in asking somebody as old as I am to introduce a speaker. Because there's no telling when my memory will totally fail. It's true that I remember lots of things from the past, but I don't remember the things I've forgotten. <laughs> but it's really a pleasure to see Ethan again. I don't think I've seen you for 10 years or more. Yeah. Something like that. Uh, I get to New York occasionally. I used to get to New York occasionally, but we never connected. But it's a pleasure to introduce him. He comes, I guess, sort of at the tail end of the activities of Cy Leventhal in terms of building what was probably the greatest molecular biology center in the United States for about 10 or 15 years. We educated lots of the people who seeded all the institutions that now send us students. It's when Ethan came, one of the things that became apparent very quickly is that he was a magnet for intellectual talent. All sorts of very bright people ended up coming to his lab. And I don't know which of them were graduate students and which of them were postdocs. But people like Ira Herskowitz and Nancy Kleckner, and I won't remember all the names, but the Ogawas came, Hideyuki and Tomoko Ogawa. They're terrific. Tomoko, I think, really made her major contribution outside of science in running the Institute of Genetics in Japan. When Tomizawa ran it, he had Tomoko at his side. And Tomoko was the associate director, and she was terrific. It was something that. There are people from all walks of life. I mean, I probably can't remember very many of the, of the people who were passing through to Ethan's lab. And then sometime, I guess it was in the early 70s, something happened. I don't know what, well, I know what it was. Yeah. It was the Vietnam War. But a subset of people in biology apparently decided that it was important to do things that were practical, not the things that they had been doing. And Ethan was among those. And that's when he switched to working with rhizobium and doing things that had to do with agriculture. And I suspect he'll talk some about that now in a little while. But I didn't make such a change. I added that kind of activity. And I ended up with a year at the School of Public Health and meddling in medical practice and the trials of medical practice, the difficulties the doctors were never educated in, and the medical schools were not interested in adding that component to their education. To ask the question, what are the possible ways can you explain, can you use to explain this particular set of symptoms? Do we know what to do about it? So. I think I'll stop there. I think that it's a pleasure to have Ethan with us. And bon chance. <laughs> Thank you.
Well, thank you, Maury. It's a real pleasure to be here. And uh, it's terrific. Uh, to, to paraphrase Saturday Night Live, MIT has been very, very good to me, and I really appreciate it. <laughs> so thank you. I mean, it's a wonderful opportunity. Old geezer gets to come back, see old colleagues, and tell the young punks how it really is. <laughs> so I came to MIT a long time ago. Uh, it was a matter of luck. And in fact, as I run through my career very briefly, I hope, uh, luck surfaces at many, in many places. Here's the luck. I started out, I was an undergraduate at Yale. I was interested in physics. And so I took some physics courses, and I rapidly found out that I was, as we would say now, we didn't say it then, mathematically challenged. <laughs> and so uh, the question was what to do. Uh, I had to stay in science, because uh, in science, you could tell what the professor wanted. And if you had the right answer, nobody could argue with you. Whereas in something like literature or language, or uh, who knew? <laughs> so, so that was great. And it turned out that there were a bunch of people, a small number of people, I should say, in the physics department in a program called biophysics. So that sounded interesting because I didn't have to do so much math. And it had living things. And you know, it was OK. And it was only much later that I found out that this was a very restricted field. Uh, it was nothing like what we might call biophysics today, despite the fact that my, both my undergraduate and graduate degrees are in it. But at the time, these were people for whom biology was shooting things at living things. Okay, So you would take ionizing radiation and subject cells to it. And you know what happened? The cells died. <laughs> wow. <laughs> this was fabulous. So, so I went all the way through and uh, got my degree. There were five of us. Uh, and then the question was what to do after that. So I had to stay in science, because in, in science, like I say, uh, you could tell what people wanted, and nobody could argue when you found it. Now, I, I should say as a digression, when I was in school at the time, that sort of meant you were smart. If you did well in school, you were smart. Now, I'm now old and wise, and I know that, that the two are related, but they have very little to do with each other. And uh, in my view, science is like any other pursuit of the human species, uh, art, music, uh, politics, whatever, uh, it's distributed in something like the Poisson, the bell curve. Most of the people in the middle have a fair amount of it. There are some outliers who are terrific, uh, Einstein, whatever. There are some other people who aren't any good at it and go into other fields. So it turned out I was pretty good in science. So that's great. So, and I should say, that's, that's a talent. And it's a skill as well. Talent is something you're born with, and skill is something you develop. And you need them both to do anything important anywhere. <clears throat> if talent without skill is just self-indulgent, skill without talent is pedestrian. So you need both of them. And so there I was. Uh, what do I do? Go to more school. That was the secret. So now, what school? Well, I didn't want to do something too far afield, so I wanted to stay in things that I knew. So shooting things at cells, that, that was pretty good. But maybe, maybe expand a little bit. And it turned out that there was this guy, Cyrus Leventhal, who had done an experiment that involved radioactive phosphorus, P32. Well, right there, I was in the right ballpark, right? Because it was almost physics. And it had to do with living cells. So terrific. So uh, I wound up here at MIT. This was in 1958, it's a long time ago. And uh, I understand from Mondana that the first year class is roughly 35 people, that order of magnitude. There were five of us in the first year graduate mm -hmm. class. Uh, two of them dropped out by the end of the year, so three of us went all the way through. Uh, things were very, very different then. I'll have occasion, if I can remember, as Maury says, the, the memory starts to get a little porous at some point. Uh, if I can remember, I'll refer to it some more. But anyway, there I was, went through graduate school. Time came to write up my thesis. I wrote up my thesis. And then Cyrus, who, who was, I should say, absolutely terrific, one of the smartest guys, one of the best scientists I ever knew, 
Cyrus said, there's this new faculty member, uh, go talk to him. And, you know, young punk, go talk to him, you go talk to him. So I went to see Maury Fox, and I got to tell you, it was like the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> I mean, I felt, uh, it scared the pants off me. I mean, now, now I'm wise enough to know that it was just an ordinary scientific dialogue, but, but boy, was I scared. <laughs> And I staggered out and finished my thesis and went off. So then, just to give you the recap of the career, then I went to uh, England for a couple of years and worked in Sidney Brenner's lab, which was terrific. And then I went to Paris and worked in Francois Jacob's for a couple of years, lab for a couple of years. And here's where the luck came in. In 1957, when I was a senior in college, the Russians put up a satellite with a live human being in it called the Sputnik. And imagine the surprise of everybody in the United States, but particularly everybody in Washington. What, the Russians who can't even tie their shoes beat us? That could not be allowed to continue. So the point was there was suddenly lots and lots of money for science. So I got to go to MIT. I got to do a postdoc in England. I got to do a postdoc in Paris. The postdoc I did in Paris, more luck. I had wanted to do a postdoc with uh, Werner Arbert in Geneva, mostly because I knew a lot of people, um, other American postdocs in Geneva, and we all used to go skiing together. So that, that seemed like a good idea. <laughs> but uh, Werner, unfortunately, when I went to visit, said, don't have any space. So on the way home back to England, I stopped off in Paris and uh, saw some people I knew there and ran, was introduced to Monsieur Jacob. And I said, with the usual temerity, uh, do you happen to have a place? And he said, well, yeah, Ed Adelberg just canceled. And uh, yeah, I have a postdoc place. So more luck. I came along at the right time. Terrific. So then it was time to come back. And so I went to look for a job. And as I recall, I visited something like 20 different universities in 10 days, or something really atrocious. And uh, MIT was the first place I came to, of course, because that was the closest to Europe, which is where I was coming from. So then I saw the other 19 places, and I came back, and I got offered a position here, which could have saved me the whole trip, but that's another <laughs> story. <laughs> so, so I took up a position at MIT. And that was great, and I had a wonderful career. It's great to have a career, looking back now, young punks, uh, it's great to have a career where you look back and you're at the best place around, just the best place around to do science. And it has a certain amount of fallout in the world outside, too. You say MIT and people say, whoa. Let me give you an illustration of this. A while back, it must have been five, six years ago, one of my computers broke down. Uh, sequential computers, not a lot at the same time. A computer broke down, and I brought it up to the Apple Genius Bar, got to go see a genius. And so the first thing they do is say, you know, your ID and your uh, statistics and whatnot. So I gave them my email address, Signor at MIT.edu. MIT, whoa, uh, what do you do there? Well, I'm a retired professor. OK. So then we go, I forget what was wrong with the, with the computer, but we go through the whole thing. And the guy says, OK, here's what you have to do. You have to go to this website and download blah, blah, blah. So I say, OK. And they say, he says, there's a manual there. And I say, and I'm going to understand the manual, right? Now, you've got to understand, my experience with the manuals might be different from yours. <laughs> my car, for example, has not one but two manuals. And the other day, I was looking something up. And I looked it up in manual number one. And sure enough, it was there. And it said, the details are in manual number two. <laughs> so I went to manual number two. And I looked it up. And sure enough, it said, the details are in manual number one. So I figured it was a reasonable question to ask the guy, uh, I'm going to understand the manual, right? And he looked down his nose at me and says, an MIT professor? <laughs> so there's a certain burden that you have to carry. <laughs> well, anyway. Uh, so I did my research at MIT. I was working on phage lambda then, which a lot of people worked on. It was a lot of fun. You could do experiments fast. There were some people, John Weigel, for example, would do a bunch of experiments in the morning, go home, go to sleep, come back in the afternoon and do some more experiments. It was, it was great. Try and do that with human cells growing in culture. Whoa. Uh, anyway, as Maury said, um, 
politics happened around there in a very big way at MIT, and I wound up going to the Far East. Now, luck intervened yet again. Noam Chomsky, whose name I imagine was familiar to everybody, was arranging trips to North Vietnam for the purpose of giving actual scientific lectures because the Vietnamese wanted to keep up an intellectual establishment even though the war was tearing their country apart. Okay, so I organized a trip. There were three other people and four of us were gonna go and then the trip got canceled for some reason. I've forgotten why. Here's where the luck came in. Because right after the trip got canceled, this event occurred. There was a ping pong tournament in Tokyo. Now, China had been closed to Americans since 1949. Okay, when the communists threw out the corrupt bandits called the Guomindang, um, and they were pretty corrupt and awful the way the Chinese communists are now, and the way, in fact, just about every government we know of is corrupt and a bunch of bandits. So the Chinese unexpectedly invited the American ping pong team to visit. This was unheard of. Now, of course, the next thing to happen was journalists went in. So four journalists, three from Life and one from The Times, as I remember, they next visited. And meanwhile, I was organizing another trip to Vietnam, this time with only one person, who was Art Galston, who passed away a couple of years ago. He bot was a botanist from Yale, terrific guy and a terrific scientist. And uh, so we thought, gee, we're gonna go to Vietnam China's right next door. Maybe we could get to go to China. So we pulled every string we could, wrote to this person who knew Joseph Needham, who's a name. If you don't know who Joseph Needham was, you should know. He's an unbelievable scientific historian of China. Uh, wrote to somebody I knew from Belgium, so on and so forth. And uh, didn't know what was going to happen. Time came to leave, so he left. And in those days, you couldn't just get on the plane and fly to Hanoi. So. It was a long trip. We went to Paris, and then we went to Moscow, and then we went to Karachi, and then we went to Calcutta, and then we went to Vientiane and Laos, and uh, then we went to Hanoi. In Paris, they used to have at the time, again, old geezer, always talks about old stuff. They used to have, on the Boulevard Saint-Germain, an Olivetti typewriter store. And the Olivetti typewriter store had a pillar in front of the store with a typewriter on it, so you could try out the Olivetti machine. So we went there, stood on the street, and typed up this letter to the Chinese embassy saying, listen, we're going to be on your doorstep, and your premier said he wanted to have relations with Americans. How about it? And so we went to the Chinese embassy in Paris, and of course the place where there were American students hanging off the walls trying to get to China, just like we did. So we dropped the the uh, letter off, and then went on our way to Moscow and so on and so forth in Hanoi. And so Hanoi was quite interesting, seeing uh, both the devastation of the war and the city, which is quite a beautiful city even at the time, and a uh, bunch of other events. Uh, I, I got busted in Hanoi. Uh, our guide took us to some place that he wasn't supposed to, so uh, the police hauled us in. The guide got apoplexy at this, the distinguished foreign visitors and all. But anyway, it was an event. So then we had to find out whether we were going to go home at the end or go to, Par go to China. So we got taken to the Chinese embassy in Hanoi. Now, that meant, as everybody there except us knew, that the trip was OK, because otherwise they would have just ignored us. That's the word, the Chinese word for no what is nothing. I'm sorry, 1971. And. Uh, so another odd event. Uh, we came with our interpreter. The Chinese had their interpreter. The two interpreters knew each other extremely well. Both of them spe uh, spoke umpteen different languages. But protocol had to be observed. So it was good evening, blah, 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 our interpreter, blah, 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 the Chinese interpreter to the Chinese person, who then said something in Chinese, and then blah, 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 his interpreter. Blah, blah, our interpreter, good evening. <laughs> it's great. So we had a nice little conversation. Now the problem was, again, customs are so different. Uh, in the United States, at least in the way I knew it, 
Uh, if you, you have a guest in for business reasons, the uh, host is the one who brings up the business after the small talk. Well, it turns out in China, or at least at the time, it was the opposite way around. If a guest came for business, it was the guest who made the, brought up the business issues after the small talk. So we were waiting for the Chinese person to do it, and the Chinese person was waiting for us to do it. Well, we finally got over that. And uh, then uh, we were asked uh, by the Chinese person, uh, how long are you going to be in Hanoi? And we told them, and uh, where are you going home then? And we said, well, it depends whether we can go to China. And he said, oh, you can go to China. So that was it. <laughs> and then, then the only other thing was that he said, do you want to go to Beijing or do you want to go to Guangzhou? Now, Beijing, I knew. Guangzhou, I had no idea what it was. So we looked at each other and, OK, we'll go to Beijing. They said, well, that, actually, you're going to go to Guangzhou first. <laughs> But it was 50-50, right? If we had said Guangzhou, they would have said, delighted to take you there. And it turned out it was the right decision because they were having a trade fair. So we got to see everything that, that was made in China at the time. So great trip. Uh, met with Joe and Lai, uh, saw all kinds of stuff, traveled around. Excellent trip. Ate magnificent Chinese food, the best ever. And uh, of course. So then came back. And uh, what next? Well. As Maury said, then I changed the things that I was working on, which had been uh, bacteria and phage, phage lambda and recombination in E. coli. And I started to work on plants and rhizobium. And the plants didn't go so well, so I stopped there for a few years, but I picked it up later on. Uh, so this is now, in, we're in the 70s. Now, China came up again 17 years later in 1988. My wife and I went to visit China at the invitation of a Chinese professor from Beijing University who had spent time in our lab, in my lab, rather. And so uh, the first or second night we were there, she arranged a big dinner for us with a bunch of people. And there I met a man who told me the following story. He was also a professor at Beijing University. He said that during the Cultural Revolution, which was the late 60s, as some of you know, a very difficult time for intellectuals. He, like many intellectuals, and his wife, also a doctor, were sent out to the countryside, basically, to shovel manure. That was considered to be a, an educational, uh, an, an instructional period for people to get rehabilitated to the right way of thinking, which was that you had to shovel manure. So he says, at a certain time, he was called into the office of the commune in which he was living and working. And he was told, get your things together. You are going back to Shanghai in an hour. So he got his things together. They had to find his wife, who was way out in the countryside somewhere, got her together with him, brought them both back to Shanghai. Their apartment had been taken over by squatters. They got kicked out. The apartment got totally cleaned up. He was reinstalled. His wife was reinstalled. And when we came for lunch that day, there they were in their apartment. And he tells me this 17 years later. He says, you changed my life. And that was really quite a moving experience. Now, I went to China again in 2005. That was 17 years after the second time I've been there. So the next trip is 2022. <laughs> do the math. And uh, I hope to be around for long enough to do that. Now, uh, oh yeah, I left out one thing from being an undergraduate, uh, uh, sorry, graduate student at MIT. I took one of the best courses I've ever taken in my life from the man who was sitting over there, Gene Brown. It was a terrific introductory biochemistry course, and I hated it. And, <laughs> and the reason I hated it was because we were told that we, we would be given quizzes in addition to the regular exams. And that meant that I had to really study and know the stuff. So I hated it. And I still know the stuff. Thank you, Gene. <laughs> so OK, so now in the 80s, I worked on rhizobium, picked up plants again toward the end, worked with Arabidopsis, had nice little plants growing all over the place. Uh, Mid-90s, 
uh, dabbled in biotech for a little bit, did not work out well, it's not my thing. And then uh, in 1997, I retired early for complicated reasons and was looking around for something to do. And again, luck reared its wonderful head. And it turned out that the Hereditary Disease Foundation, which was a foundation uh, run by Nancy Wexler, for the purpose of curing Huntington's disease. Uh, that organization was meeting to determine the disposition of some money that had been made available. And I got invited to sit in because I was doing nothing, and I think it was Bob Horvitz who managed to arrange for me to be there. And so it was decided after several meetings that a new program would be started with this new money, and they needed somebody to manage the new program, and I was looking for a job, match made in heaven. So that started something called the Cure HD Initiative, HD for Huntington's Disease. And uh, I started it in 97, stayed with that for about four or five years, and then that program was spun off as an independent foundation in the process, losing everything except its initials, and it's now called the CHDI Foundation. It is now a fairly big deal. We have of the order of a $100 million budget every year, and uh, we employ about 50 postdocs, sorry, PhDs, much later than postdocs, uh, and have three offices in New York, in Princeton, and in LA. So what a great thing to do. I get to do something, A, that's interesting, B, that actually has the possibility of helping people, although we haven't got there yet, and C, was a lot of fun. So uh, actually, Professor Hausman, who's not here, is the one to talk to about Huntington disease because he's the guy who really knows the stuff. And in fact, he was one of the people who in 1992 and 93 was able to isolate the gene and sequence the gene for a protein called Huntington, which is responsible in a way, I'll tell you in just a moment, for Huntington's disease. And that was the first disease gene that was isolated and sequenced. And so this was 1992, really. The paper appeared in 93, 20 years ago. And the thought was, OK, we got the gene. It's all downhill. We still don't even know what the protein does 20 years later. And let me talk a little bit about this. It's, it's an enormous protein. It's 3,144 amino acids, enormous. Nobody knows what it does. It has a weird structure. It has what are called heat repeats, which are basically solenoidal structures. And we think, we being the whole field, think that it serves as a scaffold for assembly of interacting proteins. Now, down at the end terminus, 17 amino acids of the way in is a stretch of repeated CAG codon, CAG codes for glutamine. So this protein is a polyglutamine protein, of which there are a number in the human genome. And a number of them cause disease. A lot of them are involved in spinocerebellar ataxias, which probably is a strange term for most people. But maybe you've heard of Tata binding protein, which most people around here know. That is a polyglutamine protein and can cause a disease called variously uh, spinocerebellar ataxia number 17. There are 30 some now. Also called HDL4, Huntington disease like 4. Now, when this stretch of glutamines, which in the normal human population, there are about 16 residues, 16 glutamines. When that stretch expands to something in the high 30s, probably above 36, 39, around there, that's when you get Huntington's disease. And Huntington's disease is terrible. It's just as bad as Alzheimer's in a different way. And what happens is the disease strikes, and you start to go downhill physically, emotionally, cognitively. And your brain starts to lose tissue. It just goes away until, by the end stage of the disease, you have a big hole in the area where the striatum used to be. 
and the striatum is the place where executive action is thought to take place. So you lose executive action and you get depressed and you get irritable and you can't remember anything and you can't walk around and you can't swallow because the muscles, it's just terrible. And so there's a big stimulus to cure the damn disease. But we don't know what the protein does. So what do we do? Well, at the moment, what CHDI is doing, several things. Number one, we're trying to develop methods uh, where the, the mutant protein with the big expansion is not synthesized. Because we know that people who don't have the mutant protein don't get the disease. So there are arguments to be made why this is not a good argument. But still, it's a simple one and it might be right. So we're trying to do that. And I should have said, CHDI is a virtual organization. We do not run laboratories. We, co we collaborate with industrial firms and academic firms. Originally, initially when I started the thing, it was academic research. And I have lots to say, which I won't say now, about how to organize academic research for disease purposes, which is different from how to organize academic research for basic research. Something else. So we work now much more with industrial companies trying to get data that will let us figure out what's wrong with people or what's, what's wrong with the cells that have the disease mutation. And at the moment, things are slowly working towards the synapse as the locus of where the problem lies. Now, of course, I say the synapse glibly. There are probably a zillion different kinds of synapses, and each one of them has a zillion different kinds of proteins in them. This is not a trivial problem. <clears throat> We're also concentrating on other things, on energetics, because one of the things that appears to happen during Huntington's disease is that the energetics, the energy that's provided to the organism, not enough, not the right kind, not enough, not clear. We're also looking at autophagy because it's possible that autophagy can be increased to eat up the mutant protein. Sort of a long shot, but. Okay, so those are some of the things that we're doing. Now, as I say, we haven't got there yet. I'm very optimistic. For years, I've been saying it's just around the corner. And one of these years, it's going to be just around the corner. So I'm happy to continue working. But it's tough. And why is it so tough? Well, there were two reasons, or two classes of reason. One of them obvious, and one of them much more subtle. One, the obvious one, everybody would agree with. The subtle one, maybe not. The obvious one is this. Our species is the result of three billion years of evolution. And that confers upon our species two things. Plasticity, that is, we can respond to conditions we can do things differently at different times, different places, for different purposes. And number two, redundancy. So we have several ways of accomplishing various kinds of metabolic processes, biochemical processes, and so forth. So that means if you have a situation where things aren't going right and you want to fix them, you're fighting redundancy and you're fighting plasticity. Now, Pharma has this model of how to do things, which is you find a protein, an enzyme, that's going wrong, and then you get a small molecule by drug screening, and you put the small molecule on the protein that's going wrong, and presto, it's, it's right. That has been applied by pharma for the last 50 or so, probably 100 years. That is a broken paradigm. That no longer works. And uh, yes, pharma has had some success with it. The technical term for that success is low-hanging fruit. That is, things that are available now. So yes, the Indians chewed willow bark, and it turns out that acetyl salicylic acid is in willow bark, and it will uh, inactivate the uh, uh, cyclooxygenase enzymes, and so you won't get a headache, and maybe you won't have a heart attack so frequently or whatever. So the, yes, there are things, there are reasons for doing this. There, there is low-hanging fruit, or there was low-hanging fruit. There isn't any more. And you can see that because look how pharma's organized. Pharma used to be the place where drugs were discovered. Not true anymore. Pharma has offloaded drug discovery to biotech firms. Why? It's simple. The biotech firm succeeds. Well, fine. 
then pharma buys the biotech firm, and everybody's happy. The biotech firm fails, too bad. Another biotech term firm goes down the tubes. Pharma doesn't care, doesn't hurt. So drug discovery is now, by and large, done in small biotechs. So what to do about this? Screening isn't such a productive thing anymore, if it ever was. I don't know if any of you remember, about 10, 15 years ago, there was something called CombiChem, combinatorial chemistry. The idea was that by combining different elements of chemicals, you could build uh, molecules that were never seen in nature before. And some of them, of course, were going to work. You never hear about CombiChem anymore. It didn't work. The chemical space that it covered was not the right space, was not enough space. Who knows? It didn't work. So what do you do? Well, it's not clear what you do. It's possible that something called systems biology is going to solve the problem. And I hasten to say that, in my view at least, this is an entire toss-up. Now, systems biology means different things to different people, but what I mean in this talk is the ability to manipulate large data sets. And that is something that you cannot do without computers and without a whole lot of technology that was developed over the last 20, 30 years. So maybe this is going to work. Why? Because the old idea of simple pathways, apologies <laughs> to Gene, the old idea of simple pathways isn't good enough. There, the best description of this, Lee Hood, out in Seattle, gave a talk once, and somebody asked him, how many pathways are there, how many networks are there in the human body? And he said, one. And that's it. Everything is connected. As John Muir said, you pick up something, and everything else in the universe comes along with it. I, I can't quote it anymore. That's a paraphrase. But so what it seems to be is that a given protein is much more likely to participate in several pathways which are connected in networks. And if you start thinking about things in that way, it becomes a very different game. Because now what you're thinking of is not manipulating a single protein, but manipulating a network, maybe by a lot of small perturbations to different components of the network, such that the network now works a little differently. And so that is an idea that's driving a lot of research, certainly in Huntington's disease, and no doubt in some of the other ones. There's a short digression. The big four neurodegenerative diseases are Huntington's, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. There are other ones. There's frontotemporal dementia. There's Lewy body disease, but they're minor. These are the big four. And uh, it's entirely possible that they're all network driven, ALS maybe to a lesser extent. But that's an idea which will or will not prove out. But at any rate, we don't know anything else to do. So at the moment, as I said earlier, we're, we're concentrating on trying to prevent the mutant protein from getting expressed. And we're doing this in collaboration uh, with a number of firms and a number of academic institutions. ISIS is one, uh, Al Nilam up here, uh, the University of Massachusetts out in Worcester, and so forth. So that's one, one approach to it. Now, there's another approach which has been posited for Alzheimer's several years ago and is not being done very extensively in Huntington, but it's based on the following observation. The age at which you get Huntington disease is determined largely, although not entirely, by how long an expansion of the polyglutamine stretch there is in a particular individual. The longer the expansion, the earlier in life it occurs. But the longer the expansion, the rarer that form of the disease is. So most people who have Huntington's have relatively small expansions and get the disease in middle age, 40s and 50s. OK, that tells you a lot of stuff. Here's one of the things it tells you. For 40 or 50 years, during which time you can by appropriately sensitive measures, find deficiencies, deficits in the individual, for example, shrinkage of the striatum. And during that time, the individual shows very few signs of the disease. So what does that tell you? It tells you the following. First of all, in mouse, 
which doesn't get Huntington's disease, but which we can make get Huntington's disease by making transgenics. In mouse, the Huntington protein, the wild type form, is required during embryogenesis. It's an embryonic lethal, day eight and a half. So it's an important protein. So now get, getting back to the human case, most people are heterozygotes. There are a few homozygotes for the mutation. This, they're really compound heterozygotes for the technical people in the audience. They're, uh, to a first approximation, their disease manifestation is similar. So now, ah, I'm running out. So now, during embryogenesis, you need the protein. And yet, if it's a disease protein we're talking about, for 40 or 50 years after that, you don't have much disease. So that says to me, and it, as it has said to a lot of people before me, there are procedures, there are mechanisms in the cell that prevent whatever is manifesting itself as disease. What are those procedures? Well, we know that the protein, despite the fact that we don't know what it does, we have pretty good evidence now that says that the mutant protein has a different conformation from the wild type protein. So it's a conformational disease. Now, we know from the people who work on this that there is a phenomenon called proteostasis, which is a form of homeostasis that involves making bad proteins better. And here's the interesting part. It's known, or it's thought seriously, let's say, that proteostasis capacity declines with age. So from this point of view, the neurodegenerative diseases are not really neurodegenerative diseases. They're diseases of the failure of proteostasis. And that's an idea that has not been farmed sufficiently, in my view. So we're trying to do a little more of it. But maybe if we get the proteostasis machinery a little bit more active, then we can delay the disease. And again, this is a very debilitating disease. If you can buy somebody with a disease 10 more years of good quality of life, boy, you've done a tremendous thing. OK, so those are the reasons, I think, why we haven't got a cure or a therapy, I should say, where we haven't got a therapy thus far. That's, that's the sort of obvious reason. Here's the not so obvious reason. And again, not everybody would agree with me. And let me sidle up to this reason. I'll approach it sideways. And here's the thing. You don't have to be a rocket scientist, and you don't even have to be a molecular geneticist to know that this culture, this culture, Western culture, is pretty corrupt. And I don't mean necessarily financially corrupt, although that's part of it. Financially corrupt, morally corrupt, intellectually corrupt. Now, a perfect example of this is that everybody lies. We know that. OK, just look at the political campaigns. Everybody lies. Now, looking at this from the perspective of a geneticist who's interested, by definition, in evolution, it's kind of weird, because uh, why should a species lie when it's clearly of an advantage to separate fact from fiction? That is, if you're a paleolithic person, you want to know whether that's a stick or a poisonous snake. OK, you don't want to lie to yourself about this stuff. So it's easy to imagine in very, very early development of the human species that lying didn't happen a lot. But now you imagine the population on the planet getting larger and larger. And now there are things like competition. And you can see where lying becomes a little bit more common. And so you get a situation now which is lies. Everybody has a bar below which they don't lie, above which they do. And everybody's bar is slightly different. And you kind of worry that as the population on the planet gets greater and greater, that bar is going to be lower and lower. And people are going to lie more and more. That's a terrible prospect. And can you imagine a species that works like that? Well, the thing is, there's one area where you don't lie, at least theoretically, and that's science. Why? Because science has a machine that tells you how to find out fact. 
It's called the scientific method. And although reams and reams and books and books and books have been written about it, it boils down to a simple three-step operation. OK, observation, hypothesis, validation. That's all. You watch the bus coming. It comes every 15 minutes. You predict it'll come 15 minutes from now. It does, fine. Your hypothesis is confirmed. It doesn't, you need a new hypothesis. And I'm talking about a hypothesis, not a theory, right? Hypothesis is conjecture. Theory is logical certainty. So that's a mechanism for keeping fact in line. And you can make the argument, which I'm making now, is that one of the functions of science in the culture is to assure that somewhere there's a way to say this is fact. OK, now, that is corrupt at the moment. And I'll give you two examples. One example is I see a lot of scientists in my activities for the foundation. And I see a lot of them who are in the maturity of their careers, age in the 40s, say. Generally speaking, people don't know what a control is. OK, anybody can do an experiment, anybody. Only smart people can do controls. I shouldn't have said that because I said smart people before. Only good scientists, smart or dumb, can do controls. It's not good enough to say, I know how this is going to behave because I did the experiment yesterday, so I don't have to do it today. But what happens if you spit in the test tube and you didn't realize it, like the early days of PCR, for example? So you got to do the right controls. So that's part of the thing, is that people are not getting trained well. And people are not getting trained well in areas that begin to matter a lot, namely in the medical profession. Now, some people in the room may be MDs, and I do not want to cast aspersions on MDs at all. Number one, I know zero about clinical practice. I have no idea whether MDs are getting trained properly for the clinic. However, I have an excellent idea that MDs are not getting trained properly for science. If you read a paper by MDs, the chances that it's wrong are much greater than if you read one by PhDs. And that's a bad situation. So that's one issue. Now, where this really comes home is in the way the drug companies work. Now, we all know pharma is an evil area, it's a convenient whipping boy and all that. Stop and think for a moment the idea Step back. Imagine the Martians landing on the planet and looking at us. And they say to us, what? You people combine health and profit? Are you crazy? So we shouldn't be surprised that pharma is evil. Fine. That's not what I'm talking about. Here's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about what purports to be the science on which pharma bases all its advertising and all that crap. And it's crummy. And let me assure you, I am not being Jeremiah in the desert here. My point is this. There are accepted truisms in the medical community, right? Obesity is bad, and if you wanna, don't want to be obese, eat fewer calories, OK? Low LDL cholesterol is bad. Take a statin if you want to lower it. Now, again, I'm not Jeremiah. There are subsets of people in these fields who argue very strongly, I'm happy to give you references, who argue very strongly that this is nonsense. Go back and look at the Framingham study. What is it, 20,000 people or some enormous number of people followed over X years? There is no overall correlation between level of LDL and heart attack. It ain't there. Now, it's possible that if you segment the population and look at certain populations, fine. Statins. Statins lower LDL cholesterol. Do they lower uh, heart attack risk? Well, it depends who you talk to. It depends whose paper you read. And then you go back to look at, start looking at the literature. And I've done this not out of uh, interest or preference, but because my wife is a type 2 diabetic, which is not diabetes. It's metabolic disease. So she got a little concerned about her health, and I got a little concerned about her future. I would like her to be around as long as I am. So, 
I started looking at some of the papers, and the papers are atrocious. The papers say, you, you read the discussion, it says, as shown in table three, blah, 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 and you go back to table three, and not only are the population is not really well matched, but the data don't say what the discussion says they say, and what the drug companies say they say. The drug companies, remember, cigarettes don't ca cause cancer? And all the scientists that said, right, cigarettes don't cause cancer, look at table three. So that's happening. And that's really bad. And the place, the only, I don't know what to do about this. The only place I can think of where something can be done are places like MIT. We've got to figure out how to train people better, whether they're MDs or PhDs or what. But the system is broken, like everything else in this culture. There has to be a better way for people to understand what's really involved in the establishment of something as fact. Now, the public at large may not care. OK, the political system shows us that, by and large, people don't act in their own interests, aren't interested in finding out what the truth is. So maybe nobody cares. But at least somewhere, somebody will be able to put a stake in the ground and say, this is a fact. So I hope. Something can be done at places like MIT, and I'll stop there.